Well, hello there. I just want to give you a really quick precursory heads up as we dive into the Series 6 reaction episodes of Inside Number 9. Stephen and I are recording these podcasts live alongside our lovely audience uh, on YouTube immediately after watching each new episode of uh, Series 6 of Inside Number 9. Uh, we don't know what to expect from each one. We're like everybody else. We're not prepared. We literally just watched it and are capturing our authentic, raw reaction to it. So if you're looking for deep level, intelligent entertainment, insight and wisdom about the content of the episode and you're trying to make sense of it, then you might well be a little bit disappointed. Uh, but we will be diving back into the series once this whole thing has aired um, so if you want to just hang out alongside two people who love the unexpected treats and surprises that come from experiencing a new series of Inside Number 9, then you're most welcome to come along with us. Uh, if you wouldn't appreciate that, then we recommend you coming back later. Uh, thanks to all of you who understand and appreciate this. It means the world to have you on board. Uh, right, that said, let's uh, head into this week's um, episode of A Quiet Night Inside Number 9. Do you want to, you want to start? This meeting is being recorded. Stephen. Andrew. Fancy spending a quiet night inside number nine? Of course I do. Here we are inside season six, episode five, How Do You Plead, which was directed by Guillem Morales, produced by Adam Tandy, written by Reese Shearsmith and Steve Pemberton, and first aired on Monday, the 7th of June, 2021. Uh, 38 minutes ago. Um, and I guess we should start by saying a massive congratulations to the entire team and to Stephen Reese for uh, a fresh BAFTA last night, which is very... Fresh BAFTA. Fresh BAFTA. <laughs> Bit of fresh BAFTA action. Um, and to all of us, really, us. For, I mean, for our yeah. achievement. <laughs> it's our BAFTA, isn't it, really? This is all of ours. <laughs> yeah, so... I mean, let's um, let's start with just instant reactions. Like, how what what did you make of that? That was a bit of a ride, wasn't it? I would say so. Yeah, <laughs> um, that was not what I expected to see at all. I'd like to know how much money I would have got for Steve Pemberton is going to be the devil <laughs> in this episode. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, when his when his eyes went red. Oh, yeah. so good. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of i I was feeling like okay, this is going to have a supernatural bent to it with the music, which sounded very stakeoutish. It had that yeah that kind of lots of strings that yeah with the the kind of reverberating strings, mm. which was cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was very enjoyable. Twists, like... Galore. <laughs> kind of Webstery weaving of things all over the shop. Which, yeah, it was nice switcheroos. Um, should, we, should we do what we did last week and start with our pre, <laughs> pre-show pre predictions? Did yeah, like- mine's definitely not as in-depth as your last week one was, <laughs> again. It involved Hollyoaks. It does not involve Hollyoaks at all. <laughs> But from what I had kind of seen already and what I'd heard, my expectation was that um, Jacoby had gotten off a criminal at some point and that they were somehow related to Reese. And Reese's character was sort of posing as a nurse to essentially torture him mm-hmm. um, and get him back for. Yeah, getting off the guy that did damage to someone who was close to him. Mm. It wasn't that. Yeah. Yeah, and even in the episode, I I was thinking... I was still thinking that. When he was going through the cases and stuff, I thought that was what was going to happen. Very clever misdirection. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I had... Um, my synopsis is, of the of, obviously, of the episode that was never written. Um <laughs> <laughs> Webster is at the end of his long and illustrious career, successfully defending some of the UK's most hardened criminals. But it's Urban's birthday, and <laughs> annoying. And Webster has forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> and in a mysterious package that arrives, are the pieces of a criminal puzzle that doesn't end well for one of them, 
who is left pleading for their life amidst a mess of party poppers, morphine, and fake blood. <laughs> <laughs> I love how um, lucid your thoughts are about these. I you sort of... Once I get into it, I'm like, yes, I'm there. <laughs> I found it so hard to... Um, to kind of come up with some kind of it was like basically just just um kind of using the images that had been posted mm. and the that basic synopsis of which they're so cleverly written so webster the famous barrister is not well and not an easy man to look after his carer urban knows how to take the rough with the smooth dishing out the drugs or appealing to the old man's vanity but on this particular night something is coming that will test webster's resolve and legal skills to the very end like the skills to write something like that and not give anything away. No, but it nails it. And yeah. it's ridiculous that it absolutely nails it and is perfect and very obvious <laughs> when you've watched it. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Absolutely um, brilliant. So is, is Derek Jacobi the first returning? I think he must be. I can't think of another. We'll um, We'll check later. We'll yeah. check back with these guys later on to find out. Obviously, I think he might well be. He didn't have a kind of massive role in The Devil of Christmas, but he had a significant part to play in that one. <laughs> Very much so, yeah. <laughs> he was not an incidental character. No. Um, so, yeah, let's – should we just sort of uh, – did you make notes kind of like last last week? Just kind of. I did. I kind of went through playing. as we went. Um which is hard to do anything else, really. But yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I made notes sort of in the weird order. <laughs> no, I um, yeah. So the first thing we see is the lift, and if I think we've been seeing quite a lot of throwbacks this series, and this felt there was a Zanzibar esque lift mm. run by a bellboy. Um, yeah, it was who we had no idea about. The devil, the bellboy. Chekhov's Chekhov Satan. <laughs> Was I, oh, che, Chekhov Satan who was running Chekhov's elevator? Yeah, yeah, the elevator direct to hell. Yes. Hmm. Um, I thought that what was interesting was that a clock that Reese was putting on a character, not obviously in the episode because this job it, within the episode he was very different when he was initially summoned by his nibs um, to come and do his nursing job when he was talking to Kurt outside. So when he goes in and he suddenly becomes like Frank Spencer, <laughs> a Frank Spencer nurse, big, camps it up yeah. to 11. Um, what a name as well. Urban Bedford. I know. I is, it, is this going to be, is this an anagram? I don't know. It's, it's not a name that I've really heard before. Not for an English person, definitely. Um, yeah. I'm sure Simon's going to be there later on when we have a look and we're going to find out it's a cryptic crossword clue. Well, I, I, I was kind of thinking uh, there's definitely, I think the names do feel significant because... Um, <laughs> like even Webster, for you, mate. <laughs> well, Webster's name, because that sort of mean, I was, like, I was looking it up before. I was like, Webster... Because Urban's obviously it stands out, and Webster means sort of weaver, which as a barrister is kind of yeah, like that's true, yeah. stories and the and you know you see it in the episode like the the weaving of of lies into truth essentially is is is, is kind of like the the Rumpelstiltskin role, um, of kind of yeah. Oh, Webster's dictionary and Urban dictionary. Oh, the two dictionary guys. The yeah. two dictionary guys, <laughs> one of which is very different to the other. <laughs> I'm guessing that the Urban Dictionary is is by a guy called Urban. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like that's all that is. Street. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've cracked it. It's dictionaries. It's all about dictionaries. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, and so I, I thought, you know. The, the same with like that char his character it felt like a put on character that he was playing um and the whole setup of he's been called mm. to kind of come back he's got an alibi which is 
him having left to go and see this concert and then he's he's summoned back but has yeah. he done something to webster to ensure that he will be asked to come back to look after him and it was and i and i felt like it was the misdirection was being pushed more and more with that dark side that we were seeing of um urban like when he was talking about a hypothetical case that was a pretty bleak <laughs> scenario that he dreamt up out of nowhere. Yeah. And I felt like this was going to be, it then it then made me start to think, has he done something and he's now looking for a legal out? Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. Yeah. I think you're meant to think that, aren't you? Like, yeah. He's got this scenario that sounds pretty absurd, but it's like, ah, brilliant. It's very specific. <laughs> yeah. But the way that Webster is so quick to, come back with a you know an answer to it it just shows how how genius he is as a i, lo I love it was the music at that part was amazing that was where the like christian henson started flexing his muscles there a bit i think it was the sort of strings kicked in and started rising up and it was hmm. really nice yeah there was some really good music in this like with you know when he he goes out and you have the sort of tangerine moment mm. with, the, with the boy in the in the chair and like there's that sort of pulsing kind of deep synth that is like because i was listening like i had it through headphones, on. through headphones so it's like oh this is rather unnerving this feels as was that boy's um striking similarities to a young boris johnson <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'd imagine that'd be more of a, an orange in the mouth deliberately yeah <laughs> slight bit of asphyxiation yeah. <laughs> kind of tory thing to do um <laughs> but, yeah. that's conjecture i am um, i really liked the kind of relationship that i mean aside from what the relationship later became i really like the relationship that was built between the two of them yeah with this kind of sort of loving sense with little mean jokes, but underneath it was genuine care. There was that, there was that bit, I think before the, um, it's kind of around when they're talking about the, the kind of drugs and he was saying the patch is barely touching the sides anymore. And, and then they have that. Yeah. It's quite a sort of tender moment of you're such a kind soul that bit. Yeah. I think, I think Derek Jacobi's, acting there like it just shows how much of a genius actor he is mm. like the way that he turns from the kind of he, he's able to hold that kind of the the mean spirited bit and also there's a real sincere authentic appreciation yeah um, which i think is like even in the context of the end i think there's whether it's a like a sincere appreciation for the fact that he is so kind that he's going to give him the ultimate sacrifice <laughs> unknowingly. Um, yeah. It's a genuine thing. I don't know, but yeah. But I mean, Bedford is telling us all the way through the episode that he's not a nice guy and that this is all a cover and this is all a character. Um, and he, yeah, he was telling the truth. Yeah, but, I was also, th is it, is he not a nice guy or is he someone well, who's he's, done a he, bad thing? Well, he's not, he's not, <laughs> he's really. done a murder. Um, he, I think that he struggles with the fact that deep down he knows that he's not a nice person and that's kind of ingrained in him, that behavior that he used to exhibit when he was younger and was a bully and deliberately choked a child to death mm. he knows is what deep down he is but he's trying you said. what was that did he say it was just for fun when he said yeah that? he answered back so it was just for fun yeah. and he knows that deep down that's who he is but he's been spending his whole life trying to repent for it yeah. repentance idea yeah that repenting idea and yeah that kind of angel I, thing. I thought that you know kind of um shades of well very gray shades of a christmas carol you know with yeah 
the clock ring. Yeah, yeah. Was, you know, at that moment, I was like, "Oh, what have we got here?" Like, there's some like the when, when the, all the power went out, and yeah. then the clocks ring in midnight, and it's like, "Okay, we're going to be visited by the ghost." <laughs> I don't know. Birthday present. Past. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, cheers man um <laughs> xylophone was an interesting name as well for the daughter in the pretend case <laughs> why xylophone but i love the fact that um that webster did not even question he, he just went with every the, the entire scenario that had been presented to him yeah he did not question any of it he just he kind of took no not at all no, he did just, you know, I'll, I'll go with this. I guess he's heard some pretty horrendous things. Um, and so nothing really surprises him anymore. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Some nice little references. The Filofax. That was a, yeah. a warm, fuzzy reference. <laughs> 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 Do you like a little throwback <laughs> reference? Did you have a fun facts? A fun fa- Oh, I did have a fun facts. Yeah. <laughs> Best thing. Yeah, ever. yeah, yeah. Like a little white kind of, yeah, ring binder type thing. Yes. Yeah, good. Good. Um, there was some, um, I felt like the, 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 little, the little cats reference, Mr. Mistopheles, um, mm. which was really weird because I, I felt like when we were being talked through um, Webster's career as a legal eagle. Um, it had shades of. Have you seen cats? Um, no. There's an there's an old cat that talks about his time um, performing in the theatre in his heyday, and kind of talking through his incredible roles. And it felt very much like that. I was getting shades of that. And then when he pulled out the Mister Mistopheles thing <laughs> later on, I was like, oh yeah. There, there are some cats things running through this. <laughs> had you had you thought that but earlier on? Yeah, I had. Yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. And now I'm frantically trying to find out if um, Derek Jacoby played Gus the Theatre Cat, <laughs> and that's why. But I don't think he did. Oh. So then we had the. Um... Oh, it's the, it brings up the sort of filing cabinet thing. He realizes that realizes that door's locked. Mm-hmm. Have the, um, or the drawer, should I say. Um, the conversation about the uniform, the barista uniform. The, but yeah, I love that. The and then knowing, knowing that he was going searching for a bobby pin in the box of wigs. So he uses it. That, again, I've... I'm being led to think that there is something really sinister going on in on Reese's part at this point here. And then him putting him to sleep while he there's just yeah. amazing montage that is the sort of montage you get in a in a kind of legal film where or a like a noir thing. Yeah. They're like kind of going through the case, they're finding the this is the little detail that stands out which makes makes law look really really appealing doesn't it It makes it it does yeah absolutely uh it was um i really enjoyed the fact that the music wasn't like imposed on the scene but was being played out of reese's phone (laughs) yes the orchestral music on his phone as though i should be listening to this kind of music while i do this i'm going to listen to my friend essentially my friend in the bbc concert orchestra (laughs) that's it i think that's you know that's what you've got to do. Like in a situation like that, you've got to create your own montage. Set the scene, like get the lighting right, pour yourself a big bowl of brandy. Well, I think it's usually the pot of coffee, isn't it? Or a pot of coffee. Yeah. It's the pot, you see the pot of coffee going down. It makes you seem fraught and like you're yeah. just trying to keep yourself awake. I remember it's so when we crucial. were at university, I, I tried doing that um, a couple of times, like, you know, <laughs> pushing it to the edge with writing an essay. Like, you, you know, it's, Essay, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna do a pot of coffee tonight. I'm just gonna do an all nighter, and it just doesn't feel as good as it looks on. <laughs> no, it doesn't. There's a certain romance on screen when you see that, and like, yeah, that guy, 
he's doing his best work right done. now. It always gets done. It always, yeah. But in real life, it never got it done. Get done, but it gets done very badly. Ropey. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and then we get introduced to the Andrew Waite, the Crown versus Andrew Waite case. Mm-hmm. Um, who was accused of strangling his mistress with a belt. That was another... So the insinuation is that Webster wasn't a very good defence barrister. Well... As he said, it was another guilt <laughs> in a dead-end career. Yeah. I, this is... It feels a bit like... Um, is it Robert Johnson? At the crossroads who sold his soul to the devil to be able to play guitar mm. and then was the world's most incredible blues player. Um and the, I guess that kind of idea pops up a lot, doesn't it, in various like mythology of you weren't very good at what you did. Yeah. But what's really strange about that is that so he's boasting about his forty five year run um of never losing a case. But he kind of suggests that there was only one that was kind of obtained by deception. There's one that he feels guilty about, and it's just this one. Yeah. Was it was it just well, that his deal with the devil only presented him with nice, straightforward ones that fell into his lap from that point that were just easy jobs? Or he I don't know. He had the talent. Maybe the the devil gave him the talent to win any case. I mean, it's weird Merely that he feels... against himself. But the thing is that the, the remorse he feels about that one case, and that's the one that troubles him and the one he feels ashamed of, if you consider the way that he talks his way around Reese's case or Bedford's case when he describes that scenario... I don't think he does feel... Because when he says... Um, he says, "You, I told you about the case, and you forgave me. So that makes you the perf, like essentially the perfect substitute for me." Oh, so that was just a test. That's how I read it. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Even like, obviously, that was the. Def- okay. Yeah, that makes um, sense. The defining point, but yeah, the fact that he is such a good person that even the worst thing that you can possibly say as a barrister, which is, I knew he was guilty. And I got him off anyway. Fake evidence, so to speak. Um, but yeah, this it's an interesting episode going after um, kind of certain areas of the legal profession, I suppose, as well, or questioning questioning the morality of. I suppose that that you know, I've kind of heard people in that area talking about like be almost being um, amoral. Well, di- and disassociated from the stuff that they're actually doing. It's like it's almost a competitive. They're driven by competition and the desire to to win. Which so I guess kind of you you disassociate from the from the humanity from the reality of what's being. Yeah, it must be, unless you are acting sort of amorally, <laughs> where you just go right. I just have to work on the facts here. Um and get what's best for the person that I'm representing, which I guess is your job. Mm. How do you leave, how do you reconcile that with justice? Yeah. It's, I guess the only way it's possible is if you are completely down the line, you go, no, no justice is that we might be able to reduce your sentence <laughs> slightly, but yeah. you still deserve to go to jail for a long, long time. Mm. That's interesting. I remember, I remember speaking to a um, a lawyer once. I was kind of semi advocating for for someone in a legal situation, which I was completely out of my depth. But this 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 guy had admitted that he'd done what he was being accused of doing, and um, the lawyer re- then refused to um, represent him because his only line was if if they admit that they've done it, then I will not represent them because I can't. Um, whereas if, if I know they've done it, but they haven't told me I've done it, they've done it. There's a, 
almost yeah. you can justify it for some reason. Um, so yeah, it's almost like that's the line. If you tell me, then I can't. Don't tell me anything that may prejudice my feelings about this case. Exactly. We all know. <laughs> Elephant it, in the room is. It becomes, it becomes on him. Like the the moral thing is. Yeah. Um, he's you've been told that he's done this, and yet you're still. Yeah. So it's, that's it's, it's a bit of a stretch, though, isn't it? It's like, well, if you haven't told me, I don't know any of this. I'm fully aware, but you haven't told me, so that removes any culpability from me whatsoever. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah, so... Um, oh, yeah, the Frozen. Is the, that, <laughs> you've probably never seen Frozen. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I love the idea of Reese watching... Disney films with his kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that was the moment that I thought, okay, Urban is definitely like from the family of that, um, that fam, uh, uh, like the Andrew White, Andrew Waite um, yeah. situation. And I don't know why, but yeah, that, that whole line of like, you know, make like Elsa and let it go. <laughs> and, you've got to forgive yourself and all of this stuff. It was almost like, okay, is that setting up some kind of thing there that I don't, I don't know. It just felt like the misdirection again, wasn't it? But. And then it all came to a bit of a head. Yeah. The power cut. Power cut. Yeah. Clock chimes, Reese lights a candle. Ebenezer Scrooge is awaiting the first ghost. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's those those balloon strings hanging down. I was like, what, mm. what's that? Oh, it's the balloon strings. Nice. Nice. But then um the lift arrives with a strange glow. The green the green glow. Yeah. I was like, out, yeah, go on. The, I've written the, the sixty years, isn't it? Sixty years ago he signed the contract. So when's that? He signed it 60 years ago. That well, would has be he been retired for a while. It must have been. But a 45 year winning streak would then put him as 15. Unless he's been retired for a while. But 45 years up to the 60 years since the contract would sign. If... Yeah, I don't know. We'll put him at 15 when he's. <laughs> I don't know. No, yeah. sixty. Oh no, it's sixty years. So it was. So we've had fifteen years retired. Yeah, fifteen years retired. So he so he signed the contract, went on a forty-five year streak, fifteen years, then retired. Now time's up. Mm -hmm. So how old must he be then? <laughs> old. Well, Derek, uh, Derek Jacobi's eighty. What is he, 85? 85, that works about, well, I guess that works. I mean, you, you don't have to play the same. Do, do you not? I think, <laughs> I think that everyone should have to play <laughs> their genuine age and the same name in everything they're in. <laughs> it's Derek. <Yeah. laughs> um, Mr. Jacoby. Mm. Yeah, so th this is when Steve's voice appears from the lift. That's he, such a haunting moment. I can't be everywhere at once. But I try to be. For some reason, that was that was the line that made me think, Devil Steve. <laughs> Devil I, Steve. At that point, did you? It was at that point there I thought, Devil Steve. And I don't know why. Oh, it, and he said, no rest for the wicked. Yes. Uh, yeah, the red eyes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Webster? Oh, God. I'm afraid not. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I'm afraid not. That was great. Um. Yeah, and then that's when uh, when old Urban goes to his defence and tries pleading on his behalf. He tries to lawyer the situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The plea bargain. 
I like the idea that the devil has spent time on Earth working as a um, lift operator just to keep an eye on the guy you signed the deal with. <laughs> yeah, so it's a bit of a commitment. <laughs> uh, I wonder how that works logistically from from sort of the devil perspective. Whether... Is there a, um, a layers of hell thing going on here as well? A bit like so he's in he's on level level nine almost mm. like in reverse where he's webster's suffering on like the top one and he's going to end up being plunged down into essentially level one <laughs> level one of hell the worst hell <laughs> one of nine it's like a reverse trip downwards yeah yeah I don't know. Because um, that's where they're headed. They are fast. The switch, the switch thing was so quick. Yeah. So you got the switch. Yeah. When so there's a switch when he offer when Webster offers up Urban and says, "Right, he can go instead. It'll be all the more delicious because he's a good soul," and that seems to have worked. Yeah, and Urban's in the lift with the devil, and then he reveals his story, and then sudden switch, yeah. which was which was so so well filmed and well done. How he just morphed into <laughs> yeah, that was great. Um, the yeah, murder becomes clear. Oh, the whole the whole bit of being relieved of the illness and they are oh, feel i feel better already <laughs> yeah. this is great <laughs> yeah. yeah so the does, illness was real that was that wasn't does, just a... does he now live forever i <laughs> cuz he's still only got a few years left in him well he's in, either way he's unless he's in hell now isn't he anyway so. well yeah but before that switch yeah, was he know. now just granted immortality? I, to be honest, it's all open, isn't it? I didn't see the contract. I'd, <laughs> I'd need to examine the contract thoroughly to know. I'd need to get a pot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> We're in for a late one, boys. Examination, bit of string music. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, Bedford reveals that he was the bully. He choked. Um, young Boris Johnson with a tangerine. <laughs> <laughs> and he was no angel. No. And he'll be seeing the other two at some point. In hell. Yeah. yeah. Going down. Literally going down. Going down. down. That's how a good court case ends with somebody going down. <laughs> uh, good and seen and seen i think we're there i think you know i don't have anything more to add i'm just sort of scouring the comments some really nice little things going on his webs are really 90 yeah he probably was oh yeah was that that was referenced wasn't it i thought oh, well, his actual age yeah good point right let's go back and re-record re that bit <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, generic Guna, 45 years, winning streak, 4 plus 5. 90 years Point. old, 9 plus naught. It's all nines. Um, generic Guna also said earlier, quite rightly, we haven't had a more grounded episode in this series yet. They've all had pretty grim endings. <laughs> mm. Hurry Up and Wait was the grounded one until the little scary hand. Yeah, I've got theories about that. I've got theories about that. Oh, the skelly hand. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, you know, regardless of the fact that you've obviously got the devil in there, um, having, I always, I've always found it creepy having a lift that opens out onto, into your house. <laughs> <Just> yeah. <laughs> um, and it's made all the more weird when you have a lift master or whatever they're called. Like, the elevator man because yes 
at least I, I suppose there's you know with a kind of maybe a penthouse suite or something you have to like use a key in order to get to access your- that lift mm-hmm. yeah yeah um, but it doesn't feel like it does it it feels like you could accidentally just find yourself in someone's suite <laughs> one, yeah. hi <laughs> cake oh lovely <laughs> oh i did that was um took away from like the film noir bit when he was doing his montage and he was chomping down on some birthday cake or cake <laughs> off a paper plate <laughs> he just wanted to see a bit of jelly and ice cream and yeah <laughs> pineapple and cheese on a stick oh that that's great Ah, uh, generic guna after listening to the podcast for months this is my first live chat pleasure to be here discussing you all pleasure to have you great we're um we're six subscribers shy of being able to have our custom URL. Oh, we are, yeah. I was hoping maybe that would be our gift by the end of the series. We might get to a hundred subscribers on YouTube, and then ha- in order to give ourselves a custom URL for a channel that we're not using as much anymore, <laughs> <laughs> we then become redundant. Yeah. That'd be good. Yeah, great. So, if you have any kind of thoughts about this episode or anything that we've talked about or you kind of yeah as you re-watch it and re-watch any of the episodes in this series then please do get in touch with us uh, via email um a quiet night inside no nine at gmail.com uh, or on twitter at aqnin9 and we will uh, yeah kind of discuss whatever kind of comes our way as we go round it again um after the series finish air- finishes airing we will dive back into each of the episodes so that um yeah we have a little bit more time to to actually think about them before we talk about them um rather than eight minutes (laughs) (laughs) uh cool have you got anything else to add there steve no i don't think so excellent well thank you everybody for joining us uh one more week have a good week everybody speak soon speak soon bye-bye The recording has stopped.